Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we've been learning about energy and we saw conservation of energy. So we'll keep talking about that for a little bit and then we'll introduce a new concept. So. So with conservation of energy, we said that whatever energy you start with turns into some energy later. And I said, you can write this as the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy equals the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. And so this statement is true for things called conservative forces. Or another way that you might see this written is that the mechanical energy equals the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And so another way of writing this kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial would be the mechanical energy initial equals the mechanical energy time. So what do we mean by conservative forces? Well, in kind of a circular definition, uh, conservative forces are forces that conserve energy. Or I guess I should say that conserve mechanical energy. And so, Forces that conserve mechanical energy are things like gravity, springs, and I think that's about all we've learned so far in this class. And then things that are non-conservative forces are things like friction, drag, And so the subtlety here is that these non-conservative forces don't conserve your kinetic energy and potential energy, but this statement is still always true. This statement is only true for conservative forces. And so basically all that you need to do to modify this statement that's only true for conservative forces is to just add 
whatever change in energy comes from your uh, non-conservative forces. Yes. Right. So this, maybe I'll do it in different colors. So the blue box is always true. So energy always has to be conserved. If you find a system that doesn't conserve energy, then uh, you will most likely win a Nobel Prize. So uh, please tell me if you do. And this black box, This statement is only true for conservative forces. So if the problem says ignore friction or air resistance, then you can just use the, the black box. But then if the problem includes uh, friction or air resistance or something like that, then you just need to add this term in red to account for the energy that's being dissipated by those other forces. So we'll start with a everyone's favorite ramp problems. So let's say that the box has a mass of one kilogram. It starts from a height of two meters. And we want to find the final velocity when it gets to the bottom. So we want. Oh, this. So if we didn't have conservation of energy, we would have to draw our free body diagram, find the acceleration of the block down the ramp, and then use kinematic equations to find the time or the velocity at the bottom, and we might need to find the time it takes to go down, or we would need the distance that it travels along the hypotenuse. But we now know about conservation of energy, so let's do it that way. So my conservation of energy statement, I so in this first part, we'll ignore friction and then we'll add friction in in a later part. So if we ignore friction, we can just write our mechanical energy statement. So that's kinetic energy plus potential energy equals final kinetic energy plus final potential. So we have, if we assume that this thing starts from rest, the initial would be zero. So our initial kinetic energy is zero. We were given some height that it's starting at. So it has some potential energy. And then if we define this, the bottom of this ramp to be at a height of zero, which we have in our problem, then we know that the final, en the final potential energy is zero because this was MGH here. Maybe I'll write out everything. So one half MB squared initial plus MGH initial equals one half MB final squared plus MGH final. 
Okay, so now it should be even more clear why we're canceling out these different energies. So the initial velocity is zero. So when you plug in zero here, you just get zero. And then for the final height, we're plugging in zero again. So this whole thing goes to zero. So if we solve this for the final velocity, so we're solving this equation for final velocity. You'll see that your m's cancel. And then I multiply the two to the other side. And then I uh, take the square root of both sides. And so if I wanted to plug in my numbers, this would be two times 9.8 times two. So that's gonna be Six point two six meters per second. So if this block was sliding from this height down this ramp, then we know the final velocity or so we know that the final, the magnitude of the final velocity is 6.26. Because energy is dealing with scalars, we don't necessarily know the direction, but you could use your own intuition to say that this would be the direction of that final velocity. Yeah. Right, so the, the because we're not, because this is all scalars, this G is a, also a scalar. So when we do scalars, we don't care about the direction. So the negative sign that usually comes with the 9.8 is because there was a vector. So like if you did the force of gravity, then the reason that this G gets a negative in front of it is because it's, in, it's an acceleration vector. But here, energy is just a scalar, so we don't use the negative sign on the G. So now let's say that you did this, let's say you're doing an experiment and you measure the velocity at the bottom. And so this was the initial problem. And then let's say we're doing a second secondary problem where we measured the final as some number less than at 6.26 meters per second. Let's say that we measured it at five meters per second. So then what is the energy lost due to friction? And so I put lost in quotation marks because conservation of energy is still always true. So that energy isn't, didn't disappear. It just got converted into something that's not kinetic energy or potential energy. So if you, for example, rub your hands together really fast, you can feel the heat that that generates and you can also hear your hands rubbing together. So that's heat energy and sound energy that's being generated. Um, so that's the energy that's being converted, right? So it's not, it's not lost, it's just not potential or kinetic energy anymore. Okay. 
So let's calculate that energy lost if the actual final velocity was five meters per second. So we can still write down our conservation of energy statement. We still have initial kinetic, initial potential, final kinetic, and final potential. And then there was this extra term from the energy due to some non-conservative force. So you might see that as NC or non-conservative. And so the setup of all of this is still the same. Your initial energy was zero, or your initial kinetic energy was zero. Your final potential energy is zero. You've got MGH initial equals one half MB final squared. So now we're given a final velocity of five. So if we move that kinetic energy term to the other side, now we have the energy loss due to the non-conservative forces by itself. So if we plug in our numbers, so this is M times G So what did I say the mass was? The mass is one kilogram. G is 9.8, the height was two. One half times five squared. So the energy lost due to friction, which is a non-conservative force. Seven point one joules. Yes. So, uh, so the final velocity that we solved for the six point two would be the velocity without friction, right? And so again, this amount of energy might have been maybe as this block was sliding down the ramp, it was kind of screeching or making some kind of noise. And then maybe if you touch the ramp, you might feel that it was warmer than when the block started sliding down. And there are other things that could be happening too, like uh, you could be deforming the shape of the, of the block. Uh, like if you think about a pencil, as you draw on your paper, the pencil is getting smaller. So some of the energy of you writing is converting into breaking off bits of your piece of pencil. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are non-conservative forces um, and you can just kind of clump them all together into this kind of formula that we have here. So if we continue this kind of example, so let's say that we found this amount of energy loss. And let's say that it's all due to friction. 
can we calculate? The coefficient of friction mu sub k. So this will be uh, going back to our forces picture because. We know that work and energy are related and the work done by friction is going to be the force of friction dotted with the distance. And then remember that dot product just became the magnitude of these things times cosine of the angle between them. So if we look at our ramp and we draw a free body diagram, we've got normal gravity and then friction force. So as we've seen before, if we want to solve for, well, first, we know that the definition of friction is the coefficient of friction. And in this case, it'll be kinetic because it's sliding times the normal force times the distance. And then cosine of the angle between them will be either 0 or 180. but the the sign isn't going to matter for right now. So now we need to know the normal force in order to solve for uh, the coefficient of friction because we have the change in energy that we calculated before. So if we wanted to solve for the kinetic of friction, we would just divide everything to the other side. Cosine of zero is just one, so I'm not going to write it. And then you see in this equation, the only thing that we don't know is the normal force. But because we have our free body diagram, we know we can solve for the normal force. So we know that the sum of the forces in the y equals zero, m a y. So because this, if I write, rotate my coordinate system, then the, there is no acceleration in the y direction. I get that my normal force minus the y component of gravity equals zero. Normal force equals the y component of gravity, which is mg cosine theta. So if we plug that into here, then we get the kinetic coefficient of friction is delta E over mg cosine theta. And I guess I have too many thetas running around. So I'll call this theta one. And theta one is the angle of this ramp, not to be confused with the theta that we wrote initially, which is the angle between the friction force and the uh, distance it slides down the ramp times D. And so if we plug in all of our numbers, the change in energy we calculated was 7.1. The mass is one. The gravitational acceleration is 9.8. The, I don't know if I gave an angle for the ramp. 
let's see. I didn't give a value, so let's just call it 25 degrees. Cosine of 25 degrees. And then the distance that it would slide down the ramp. So we were given the initial height was two. And if we have this angle 25 degrees, then we can calculate this distance D using trig. So this is opposite. So this would be sine of 25 equals two over D. So D equals two over sine 25. Four point seven three meters. And all of that work results in the coefficient, the kinetic coefficient of friction between the block and the ramp to be. Zero point one seven, and there's no units on the coefficient of friction. Um, and if you were being careful, you would keep track of all of these units, but you would find that they all cancel. So what we did was the first part was using conservation of energy, which you guys have seen before and you worked on it in your homework last week. And then what we're adding today is that that conservation of energy can also keep track of your non-conservative forces. So we calculated the energy lost due to friction. And then you can go a step further and calculate things about that friction force using the relationship between the work equation and the change in energy. So a lot of different concepts that can come together all in one problem. 